Biobalance HealthCast, Episode 106, PMS and Depression. Biobalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging, covering treatment and solutions that include bioidentical hormone pellet therapy, safe and affordable skin rejuvenation, and spa quality botanical skincare. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of Biobalance Health, and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. So one of the challenges that we have in our conversations is the usage of the wording. And every profession has its own jargon. Mm -hmm. And then other professions come in and take that jargon and modify it for use in their profession. Interpret it. And then there's the general public using the same words mm -hmm. as well. Uh, and it's funny how things evolve over time. I mean, wh when I was in school <laughs> many, many years ago, there were categories that identified uh, IQ development. And on the lower ranges, we had terms like moron and idiot and retarded. Mm -hmm. uh, those became so absorbed in the vernacular as, uh, as accusatory statements or right. d dismissive Negative. statements about somebody that they became contaminated and the profession didn't want to use them anymore. I mean, mm -hmm. can you imagine, you know, giving a, a family of a young infant an IQ test and come back and say, your child is a moron, oh my all, the, all the that social be... impact of that yeah. message. So they came up with new terminology that was not emotionally laden and, and not uh, offensive. So they say, yeah. now they say profoundly mentally retarded. So someday that so may, that's more that may be. So that may also become. Someday become. Yeah. The well, you're just a PMR. Of, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. What does yeah, that mean? Yeah. So, so that sort of thing happens. Uh, in my profession, in counseling, there's terminology like uh, transitional object that gets used that I have no idea by what that means. different <laughs> theoretical constructs differently. Mm -hmm. And so you always have to qualify whose definition you're using. Now everybody wants to know what a transitional object is. Well, a transitional object is something like a binky or a blanket oh, oh, okay. uh, that, that babies attach to emotionally when mom is not around. And then it goes to and then it goes alcoholism to, and <laughs> cigarettes, and, you know, and what? sex yeah. obsession. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, so in, in, that's, that's a psychiatry um, kind of progression. Yes, yes. <laughs> that but, wasn't what really happens. <laughs> no. Uh, so in our conversations, one of the terms that, w that come up regularly as a medical question, as a psychological question, and then just conversationally, mm -hmm. is the term depression. Mm -hmm. And another term that comes up across those brackets is the term uh, premenstrual syndrome, mm -hmm. PMS. Oh, she's PMSing. Well, what does that mean? If you talk to uh, someone whose friends are, some, some teenage girl uh, whose friends are mad at her because she's having all kinds of mood fluctuation, due to breaking up with her boyfriend, having a final mm -hmm. exam, her parents are just getting a divorce, she hasn't slept because she's been playing Halo 4 for three days, uh, <laughs> and they say, oh, she's PMSing. So mm -hmm. that is not a technical term. And but if isn't I, it a completely descriptive term? It's a wastebasket term for she's that's depressed. That's a good term. Wastebasket term is it's, a good term. It's just like, term. you know, yeah. she's female and she's acting crazy, so it must, so be, it must PMS. be PMS. And so that's, that's an aberration. But, but as an OBGYN, if you're sitting around with your colleagues and you talk about PMS, there's specific scientific meaning right. to that, that mm -hmm. you guys understand, okay, that's a category of information Basically, it's, that's professionally transmitted. There are many symptoms that happen in the second two weeks of the cycle, from ovulation until some, a woman starts a period. So day 14 to day 28. 28, if, if their cycle is 28 days. Yeah. So that means two weeks out of the month, they don't feel well, they act depressed, they crave, they may be anxious, they may be irritable, um, they bloat, I mean, that would make you irritable. <laughs> and I mean, they, they don't feel well, they don't sleep well, they wake up all night. So two weeks out of the month, that's how they feel. And that's any or, or all of the above can be PMS. What PMS is not is any time of the month feeling like that. Right. You know, if you feel like that all the time, that's not PMS. So you're talking about physical symptoms like bloating, but mm -hmm. what most people in the vernacular tend to reference are mood fluctuations. Right. 
irritability, mm -hmm. crankiness, snappishness, de depression. Because that's what affects them. Yeah. But the person that has the PMS is having cravings and bloating and, and breast pain and, and things that affect themselves, but how the world sees them. Okay. Or us. <laughs> I used to have that really bad. I'd come in and say, okay, girls, ladies, my office had all ladies in it. I'm not going to feel good. I don't feel good today. So you guys just kind of put your helmets on and, 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 and be nice and don't fight with each other because mm -hmm. I'm not in a great mood because it'll be over in a week. Mm -hmm. You know, basically they understood what I was talking about. Right. So I just warned them because <laughs> I mm -hmm. knew I wasn't feeling well. So that was PMS. All right. So PMS is, is one of the terms. Mm -hmm. and depression is another one right. because there's a linkage between PMS and depression. Mm -hmm. But depression exists outside of that definition as right. well. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and depression, you can have clinical depression, which is when you come and see somebody like me mm -hmm. or you go to a physician or psychiatrist and you get a, a medicine to treat mm -hmm. that. Uh, or you can have subclinical depression. You can also have comorbid depression. You can have depression with anxiety or mm -hmm. with PMS or with some other factor. You can have reactive depression, which is like mourning. Someone yes. dies. Your dog dies. Your dog and, and runs away from home. Your husband leaves home, you're not depressed. Your dog leaves, <laughs> you're really disturbed. <laughs> yeah, you go, okay, see ya. If you're like in your 40s and you're not on testosterone, you say, ah, well. Yeah. If you're on oh, testosterone, well. you may you cry break. and be depressed. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but that's true. I mean, it's a reactive, it's reaction to something in real life. Yes. And that's a normal so, kind of depression. So we started to have this conversation because there was an article in the most recent issue of Gender Medicine mm -hmm. uh, where the, the people who wrote the article had done a survey, uh, a data mining survey. Mm -hmm. Which means that they just looked at articles. They didn't see a patient. They didn't create any information. They just looked at all the articles they could find. Right. And what they were looking for was to see if they could identify in the research that's already been done by other people in other places, mm -hmm. a linkage between PMS and depression. Right. And what they found was that they couldn't find a scientific linkage because of the corruption of the terminology. Right. Uh, to, because everybody uses these terms to mean so many different things. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's kind of like statistics. You know, we, we talk about statistics one of the things that I was taught in school is that figures never lie, but liars always figure. Mm -hmm. So you play with the statistical base to make it larger or smaller to prove your point. Right. So you, whatever point you want to prove, you can move the numbers around until it makes your point. Exactly. It's, it's not considered ethical, but it's done all the time. It's done by everybody. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's human nature. I want to make the best case I can. I want to be convincing. I want to appear knowledgeable. So I throw out a statistic. And half of them I make up. That means when you listen to anybody saying, well, this research study said this, right. you have to always wonder who they are, what they wanted it to say, how they got there. Did they do the proper research? Do they have a definable, a definable uh, disease or symptom that they can actually look for? And yeah. how did they look for it? How did they document it? So not every piece of information out there, God knows, is correct. And when they have a research study, you have to say, well, what did the 2,500 research studies that came before this say? If it conflicts with it, you kind of have to wonder, hmm, what does that mean? Does, did right. somebody just try to change the rules on doing the research? Well, and in the, the survey, the data mining survey that they did for gender medicine, they, they looked at 47 different surveys, mm -hmm. and just under half of them identified a linkage between PMS and depression or mood fluctuation. Mm -hmm. Uh, but then when they tried to dive down into that to say, well, what is the linkage? Mm -hmm. It got lost again in mm -hmm. the terminology confusions. Well, part of that is that all these studies were done loosely. They weren't done tightly. They weren't looking for symptoms between day 14 and 28. Mm -hmm. You know, they, there's a lot of things that can change PMS. Like yeah. if someone's on the pill, then in general, they don't have PMS because the pill stops that up and down of estrogen and progesterone mm -hmm. or the lack of progesterone between day 14 and 28. So it's one of the ways we treat PMS. We put people on the pill and there's, there's no PMS, there's no depression. So that's one way you have to keep those people out of the, that study. Yeah, It can't be in there and, and we couldn't tell whether they were in there or out of there. It has right. to be 
women who are cycling, not menopausal, women who are not on the pill, not on any hormonal, uh, any hormonal manipulation or treatment, and then you have to look at their mood and when it happens. Okay. So, so you have to start with your doctor hat or your scientist hat mm -hmm. on, knowing the clinical parameters for PMS mm -hmm. and the symptoms that women who have PMS present with. Mm -hmm. So you have to know it's day 14 to 28. Mm -hmm. You have to know these other factors are involved. Then you look at mood, you know, like, like bloating and, ear, and uh, thought disruption and irritability and those kinds of things. And you have to know the physiology behind it, which means, which is, this happens because at ovulation, the, uh, where the egg was ovulated from makes too much estrogen and not enough progesterone. So that's mm -hmm. the physiology behind it. Okay. The next step is, if you have too much estrogen and not enough progesterone, it goes to the brain and you don't have enough serotonin, which makes you depressed. Okay, so that's the physiology of it. Right. Now, the interesting thing is the American College of OBGYN refused to admit that PMS existed into the late 90s. Oh my gosh. It didn't exist, they said. They Why? just said, no, it's not real. It's not real. We were imagining it. Everyone was imagining it. I thought that was pretty, pretty misogynist. Uh -huh. And, you know, I, I don't expect any more from them. So, I mean, it, well, it was. I, you know, I like that misogynistic terminology because there is in our culture, just like I started talking about the, the corruption of terminology to, to be uh, dismissive uh, in, in terms of IQ, mm -hmm. the same corruption of terminology allows us to be dismissive of women. Mm -hmm. if, if I can say, oh, you're just a helplessly moody bitch that you have <laughs> no control over because you're woman's stuff, is making you that way, then I don't have to give any credence or sympathy or support to any argument that you're making or any reality that you're experiencing. I, in, in my wisdom as a male, I can just sit back and go, oh, the little woman's having PMS. Yes. And so I don't have to acknowledge that there's maybe a subset of concern about the way our household is running or the way I'm managing money or the stress that she's under or the way the kids are behaving or a crisis in her career. I can just Put Dismiss it aside, her. go to the bar with my buddies, and we can all hoist one and, and laugh about how women are such moody creatures. And if only they were rational and logical like us. Well, some of us, I mean, I'm pretty rational and logical. I think a lot like a man, <laughs> but interestingly enough. Well, I'm not. I get upset. I know. I know. I know. It's yeah. okay. <laughs> uh, interestingly enough, the worst, the, the very worst misogyny happened when. For, to me, when I'd been practicing at a hospital where I trained mm -hmm. over 25 years, and I was in, at the time, and I was in a C-section room on a particular day of the week, and all of a sudden it smelled like somebody backed a truck up to the, to the room. It smelled like exhaust. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I didn't notice it at first because I was concentrating on getting the baby. I was third C-section, so it took a while. Then the husband of my patient stood up and he said, I'm dizzy. The exhaust that's coming in here is making me dizzy. Yeah. And then I realized, because I blocked out everything besides my surgery, right. that yes, there was, that, that means there's carbon monoxide coming in. Mm -hmm. So I sent him out of the room okay, to get fresh air. I then went as fast as I could to get the baby out. I put oxygen on the mom. Right. I put. I told the pediatrician to move the warmer out, so the baby would be in right. in better oxygen and turn the oxygen on the minute the baby was born. Right. So I made all these plans, and we're still trying to get this baby out, and it was a difficult C-section. Mm -hmm. Well, I I didn't know where it was coming from. I called for the head nurse. You know, you do that, but you're operating. Right. So. The nurse, the scrub nurse beside me passes out. Oh, I asked wow. for another scrub nurse. Next. Next. Yeah. Get her out of here. Put her on oxygen. Right. Bring somebody else in. I mean, it was, a, it was an obvious fact that there was carbon monoxide right, in there. Right. Okay? And it Bodies was, on the floor. And it was exhaust. Yeah. Then across from me, the other nurse drops. Right. I'm serious. I mean, and I'm calling in the head nurse. The head nurse stands there in full clothing outside the door, and she goes, it is not carbon monoxide. You can't smell carbon monoxide. I uh -huh. swear to God. Yeah. I said, can you smell exhaust? Because that has carbon monoxide in it, and I don't know what's going on here. Right. But we're in trouble. So right. get somebody in here to fix it. Right. 
And, and I finally got the baby out, but then I have to stitch up the patient. Right. So we got the baby out of the room, oxygen on everybody except me and my, and my resident. And I finally, we finally got her closed, but not until I started dropping instruments. Yeah. I thought I was okay. That's what carbon monoxide right, does. Right, right, right. I thought I was okay. I looked at my hands. They were cherry red. Anyway, bottom line is this obvious thing that I obviously saw, and so did many other people, the head nurse kept saying, that wasn't carbon monoxide. I said, just give me an oxygen mask. Mm -hmm. And I sat there sucking in oxygen, and I was disoriented the rest of the day. Luckily, another resident came in and closed her. But... And we didn't have a disaster. The baby was fine. But only because I changed all these things, everybody else was in denial. Right. Then I was called in front of the medical director, who's a horrific misogynist. He just doesn't think women should be Is that there. his medical specialist? Yes, special. his yeah. misogyny. Actually, he was a pediatrician, which made no sense because there's a lot of women in pediatrics. But he's the medical director or was the medical director at St. John's. And he sits across from me, and he tells me that I've had an hysterical event that I've imagined this. Of course, hysteria only happens to women. Right. I mean, in Greek, in Greek mythology, it goes back to the whole lunar cycle, right. the mood, the tides. The, you know. Right. But hysteria doesn't happen to men. Hysterical events don't happen to men. They only happen to groups of women. And he hands me, I, he has these articles about hysteria. hysteria. Yeah. <laughs> You've been hallucinating. You hallucinated I those hallucinated people fell to the floor. All of that, yeah. the patient's husband had it on tape, which he didn't know. I knew. So I just smiled because mm -hmm. this guy was such a jerk. And he wanted to make me crazy and fill my chart, my, my chart at the hospital with, with, oh, she's crazy. And I said, could I have those articles, please? So he made me copies of the articles that he right. was accusing me with. Right. And then I had evidence. And, and can I see your degree in psychiatry? He's diagnosing you as a hysteric. Well, I just, I just was very calm, as I've learned to be. Take all the evidence in, go out and write down all the notes about what he said, and send them to the board of directors of St. John's. I never heard a thing. Not one thing. And the patient sued the hospital. And I said, please don't sue the hospital. Did they Let ever me... figure out what was wrong with yeah. the exhaust? Okay. <laughs> it was. They have a generator that works on, on gas, not natural gas, but, but petroleum, mm -hmm. on the roof of the hospital mm -hmm. that they test every Wednesday morning, and it sits right next to the air intake for, like, for surgery. Clever planning on someone's part. All they had to do was move it, yeah. and that, I mean, yeah, that's $100,000, so what? What are they going to have to pay in lawsuits? And, and they, well, especially if there's harm to a baby that lasts a lifetime. I know. Yeah. I know. So I called, you know, I called the medical... I ended up calling the um, Department of Health. I'm impressed with how you handled it. My, my wife would have looked at me if I'd said something as inane as that and said, oh, honey, you're not thinking with the big head. <laughs> well, but you would never be accused of being hysterical because you're a guy. <laughs> you know, I was, I've been working as a male and doing a male job and right. doing everything a male does and a female, and this twerp... Yeah. Who doesn't do anything but like pass judgment on people at the hospital? Right. Doesn't work, you know. Has a has a, a cushy job, and he's telling me this. I just, I just couldn't believe it. But I t I told my husband about it, and he said, "So what kept you from jumping across the table yeah. and strangling him until he died?" And I said, "The fact that I wasn't hysterical." Because I'm not hysterical, <laughs> and because I know that this is a man who will never be better. He's yeah. terminally misogynist. And by I the don't way, want to waste my time. Misogynist and twerp are both non-medical yeah. terms. Yeah, so they are. They're in the vernacular. So he just he just. How do you really feel? Well, this is like one of those you know <laughs> sentinel of events. Yeah. So 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 PMS is under this same heading. Yes. Women only get it. It must be. Well, and that's it must so be our fault for so many women, and they and they get legitimately enraged and outraged when people dismiss them, and when they dismiss them for such non-evidentiary, tangential, cultural bias reasons. Well, the American you know, College of OBGYN dismissed them forever until the, until the millennium, and then they said it's a psychiatric disease, not a hormonal disease, which kind of dismisses them. Comes with the high tide. You know, it's a progesterone <laughs> deficit. 
<laughs> I've measured it. I've been treating PMS since 1986, my second year in practice. I gave them natural progesterone, and it made them better. Yeah. I was the only one in town doing this in the city. Well, and that's what's because fascinating about you. I you knew. Don't, you don't get lost in proving the case. You look at the results. I look at the patient's symptoms. I yeah. do the testing. It don't came care out, what you call it. I don't you care what it? you call it. You yeah. have it, and it's clear that your cycles aren't working. Those people also couldn't get pregnant, stay pregnant. They, I mean, they didn't have enough progesterone. It's like the joke about the doctor where the patient comes in and says, I'm having this and this and this symptom, and the doctor says, have you ever had that before? Yeah. I said, well, you've got it again. That'll yeah. be, you know. You but look at the results. Are those, the symptoms better? Do I treat specific symptoms? And not worry quite so much about what you call it. Well, if you if you send people to medical school, yeah. you're supposed to teach them how to think. Yes. Not how to be a computer to just spit back information like, you know, oh, your symptoms this, I'll give you this drug. Yeah. That's not what we're taught to do. Well, you you're know, taught to think and think through the physiology of everything and then see if the study makes sense. But you're also taught for other reasons to use the correct diagnostic codes for billing, <laughs> uh, the computers to figure out how much time it's supposed to take you to do uh, this kind of delivery and how which drugs are appropriate for this diagnosis. We have the same thing in my profession. And when I teach, which I've done for 30 years, mm -hmm. for people to be counselors or I do supervision, one of the discussing challenges that we have is about the use of diagnostic labels. There's, there's a book called the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical And we Manual, use them as well. That, that our uh, profession uses. Mm -hmm. And the danger is that you get so absorbed in the criteria for the diagnosis or in the label of the diagnosis, you don't see the client anymore. Right. You know, the client is more than a diagnosis and less than. And so you have to, you have to mm -hmm. dance that dance to say, are they getting better? And, and worry about that more than you worry about the diagnosis code. Mm -hmm. At least that's my position. That's true, but when I read this study, all it said to me was, nobody here looked at a patient, mm -hmm. or thousands of patients like I have. Nobody sat down with each person over the course of 29 exactly. years and asked them their symptoms. When did they start? When did they end? How did you feel? What was, what was the impact on your family? Could you work? Some people come in and say they're homicidal during that time. I mean, yeah. that's like the extreme of it. Yes. That's something you can't ignore. Right. And it's both, that is both hormonal and psychiatric. So you, it triggers something that's different than just plain PMS. You have to hear this. And when I look at these studies, they say, oh, yeah, PMS doesn't really call, right. have depression associated with it. Well, yes, it does. After, after I've talked to all these people, I know that that study doesn't really show the true picture of what a person or a group of women is going through. Well, and then when you say that, it, it's a perfect link to the next podcast that mm -hmm. we're going to do because you say there are hormones involved. And we're going to talk about the hormone estrogen and the connection to estrogen uh, estrogen issues, loss and depression. And estrogen loss and depression. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk more specifically about the clinical definition of depression. Mm -hmm. So thank you for listening. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. Follow Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Brett Newcomb can be found at brettnewcomb.com.